uh, an old friend, uh, uh, Dr. Michael Fonseca from uh, Abbott Labs. Abbott, is it Abbott Labs or Abbott? Abbott's Abbott. Um, so Michael did his, uh, is kind of a Georgia Tech lifer, did his uh, bachelor's degree, his master's degree, and his PhD in, in EECE here at Georgia Tech, um, specializing in MEMS, uh, worked for his PhD. Uh, around the same time or during his graduate work, he was the number two employee at CardioMEMS, a small startup that came out of uh, Mark Allen's work here. Um, and that then kind of made it big and got bought out by a company called St. Jude. Uh, and then that got bought out by, by Abbott. So that's where he is today, uh, where he is director of product development. Um, he's on the technology that he's going to talk about. He has uh, eight patents to his name. Uh, and he's also a member of the external advisory board for the Southeastern Nanotechnology Infrastructure Corridor, Scenic, which is the uh, NNCI node here at Georgia Tech. So, Michael, great. Thank you. Thanks, David. Uh, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be here. I was talking to David earlier when I got here. Uh, I think it was about 10 years ago uh, when I had the privilege to come speak to an audience just like this about where we were, what CardiMEMS was doing, uh, and what were our challenges at the time. And so today I've got a presentation that's going to be similar, uh, but it'll be different. You know, one of the things that I was thinking about when Amy reached out to me and said, "Write an abstract uh, about what you're going to talk about," I, I, I thought about what could I present that was different, at least for me, because I've been doing this for a really long time. I've been working on this product for about 17 years now. And I wanted to tell a story from a different perspective. And so certainly today, the story for CardiMEMS is not so much about can we do it, which is really the challenge we faced back in 2008, but what can we do with it? What, what can society do with it? And so before I start, I'm going to talk a little bit about context. And, um, in my field, or in the med device field, standard of care is something that is thrown around. It has a legal term, and I won't go into, into that, but standard of care really means what's kind of common knowledge in terms of how you take care of patients. And in the space that I'm in, we're really interested in improving the lives of patients with heart failure or other disease states. That's what Abbott specializes in. And specifically for me, it's interested in how do you improve the lives of patients that have chronic diseases? And so that's what I'm gonna talk about today. In that story, in that chronology, I'm going to talk to you about CardioMEMS, uh, where it came from, what, how we struggled, what was our chronology, and, and hopefully give you a glimpse into the real life of what a startup goes through and what it takes to make a product a commercial viable product. Let me start with one quick example. Uh, this is something many of you are very familiar with, I'm sure, and uh, that's hypertension. Hypertension is high blood pressure. Uh, many of you probably already know that one way to manage high blood pressure is to measure your blood pressure. This is common knowledge. This has been around for a very long time. Um, the technology for measuring blood pressure has been around for a long time. If I look at, you know, when this figment in the manometer was developed, it was 1896. So we were measuring blood pressure as far back as 1896, and this has become common knowledge. In fact, nowadays there's a lot of technologies for measuring your blood pressure at home, smart devices that measure your blood pressure. You can go in a pharmacy and sit in a booth and they'll measure your blood pressure. This is what we consider today's standard of care. It took a long time to get there. This is not something that happened overnight. If you think about the monitors at home, you know, they started playing around with these devices back in 1970s. That's when the first monitors started showing up at your house to measure blood pressure. And they're still not quite as accurate as we'd like them to be, but that risk-benefit analysis that all physicians have to do is just about right for this device. It's not nearly as invasive as some other devices, but it, it gets the job done. Let me give you another example that we're all very familiar with. This is probably not as old as hypertension, but it's been around for a long time, and that's diabetes. This is a chronic disease that dates back to the Egyptian area where they, they were describing a lot of the symptoms that we see today. Most of you already know that the way you manage diabetes is by measuring blood glucose, and then you dose insulin. This is a common cycle feedback loop in how you manage this chronic disease. And the technology has been advancing for the last four decades to where today, and this is kind of a shameless plug for Abbott really, um, they develop a patch with a reader and it'll give you continuous monitoring of your blood glucose. Um, and you know, the, 
the technology has been seeking ways to minimize how invasive the technology is, the reduction of blood pricking, and, and all these sorts of monitors and advances. But the, the core knowledge of what you do and what, it's, what is useful has been around for quite some time. And it's taken about four decades to get to where this common knowledge of treatment is not even questioned. You guys already know this. This is, this is very familiar. So now I want to talk about heart failure. And this is a disease that's very complex. It's not a very simple disease. There's a lot of causes of heart failure. Um, this is straight out of the American Heart Association, and, and they list over here all the different ways in which can lead to heart failure. Some of them are genetic, some of them could be coronary disease, uh, it could be diet, it could be a variety of factors. And it's, it's a complex disease because there's no single answer. It's not like diabetes where you just treat with insulin. It's not like high blood pressure where you just measure blood pressure and then you just try to lower the blood pressure. There's a lot of comorbidities and a lot of other factors that play into it. But what was striking to us was, what is the standard of care for heart failure today? And so this is straight out of the guidelines. You know, there's societies in the medical industry that get together and they look at all the greatest literature and publications and trials and they establish what the standard of care should be or their, their guidelines for medication or treatment of different diseases. And every few years they get together and they update these. This one's from 2013, I believe. And most of the guidelines for heart failure are related to symptom management. So I want you to think about for a minute in those two examples I gave you, the symptoms for diabetes, the symptoms for high blood pressure. With high blood pressure, it's really an asymptomatic disease. You don't feel any really different, but it leads to stroke and it leads to other catastrophic events. And we don't wait for those patients to get to where they have a stroke or they have catastrophic events to manage their chronic disease. Same thing with diabetes. You know, you don't wait for somebody to get hypoglycemic before you start to treat them or manage them. But in heart failure, that's exactly what we do today. That's been the standard of care all along. You monitor weight. You look at symptoms. How do you feel? Do you feel, do you feel better? Do you feel worse? That's been the standard of care. And then there's a variety of drugs. I mean, a cocktail of drugs. I didn't list them. There's too many to list. Uh, this is how you treat the disease, as well as some devices. So here's where we start to get interested in what's going on in the industry. What kind of devices do we have? Uh, well, in, in the medical guidance, you've got really three devices that they offer up. One is ICDs. The other one is CRT. So cardiac resynchronization, resynchronization therapy is really a way to remodel the heart and its electrical aspects. ICDs are really about defibrillation and controlling the electrical circuits. And then if you get really, really sick, you're really only left with two options. You can get a pump an artificial pump, which is really advancing in the last decade at least in terms of a viable option instead of transplant. Transplant is a, um, is, is a procedure that is limited in resources, and so that's always going to be limitation of transplants, is the number of available hearts to transplant. So the pump industry needs to catch up in terms of the invasive uh, aspect of it and the risk factors that are associated with it. But this is the standard of care that's provided. And none of these are really dealing with what's at the heart, no pun intended, of heart failure. Just to take a step back, if we look at where heart failure has come from, you know, one of the striking things about our history is that over the last several years, at least since the 1980s, the med industry has been doing a great job of reducing coronary disease. So this is cholesterol, this is heart attacks, and way back then it led, it led to death. And now we're keeping a lot of these patients alive reducing coronary disease, but at the same time, there's this funny correlation with the increased occurrence or prevalence of heart failure. So this is, this is one, one interesting piece of information. If you look at heart failure in the U.S. and how we treat it today in terms of the cost in Medicare, uh, these are, this is a, a plot of all the hospitalizations that occur in the United States. I think this data is probably from uh, the early 2010, 2011 era. But it's, it's striking, you know, the disease and the prevalence of it in the U.S. And then globally, it's, it's similar. You know, a lot of the countries in Europe and Asia and South America have, have similar heart failure disease conditions. Just to give you some facts about the prevalence of, of this disease, there's about 6 million people in the United States today with heart failure. Uh, there's about a million hospitalizations every year. And if you go to Medicare, Medicaid, and you look at the budget, the number one line item budget is going to be management of heart failure. When you bucket all the expenses in the United States, we spend more money on heart failure than anything else in this country. So it's, it's a huge disease. It's a big problem. So I want to I make sure that uh, I convey that message. 
Again, if we go back to the guidelines of, of care, you know, they subdivide heart failure into different levels or stages, and then they classify it uh, into class one, two, three, and four, with class one being, essentially, these are classifications of symptoms. So if in class one, you may have heart failure, but, but you have no symptoms. You can't really tell that you have heart failure. In class two, you're starting to see some symptoms. Uh, common therapies for this is gonna be CRT or resynchronization, resynchronization therapy, sorry. And then in class three and four is where you really start to get, get sick. This is where more intervention needs to take place. And there's a huge opportunity, even today, in these areas. If you, if you look at a cross-section of heart failure, uh, usually they're classified into two sec segments. Uh, heart failure with preserve ejection fraction. Ejection fraction is just a measure of how much blood the heart pumps. And we'll, we'll talk about you know, what are the key characteristics of heart failure, things that we care to monitor and manage. But preserve ejection fraction is basically a way of, of measuring the amount of blood that your, pumps, that your heart pumps out every time it, it beats. And for this segment, there's not a lot of devices. If you look at on the med device space, you know, most of it is just medical therapy and looking at symptoms. So there's, there's opportunity there. Reduced ejection fraction, these are patients whose heart is really failing uh, in the sense that it's, it's not producing a lot of volume of blood to your circulatory system. And this is where a lot of devices have seen a lot of success with CRTs through this class of heart failure all the way down, down to pumps. And so this is, where, this is where we come in. This is where CardioMEMS originated. We were looking at how do we take how do we take this opportunity and improve the lives of these patients? So if we go back and look at the definition of heart failure, it's really the weakening of the heart. Your heart is a pump. It pumps blood. Um, this is a system that cares about pressures and volumes. And if I show you a quick CGI here, and hopefully you're not going to be too disturbed about the CGI of heart, we're really looking about the cyclic cycle of pressure and volume in the heart. And so what was striking to us was, why is nobody paying attention to these key parameters within the heart? Pressure and volume. Why is nobody measuring key aspects of the heart that could help you manage this disease? Because at the end of the day, either you're trying to improve the volume output of the heart, because it's been reduced because of the disease state, or you're trying to measure and monitor the pressures if they get too high or too low, leads to different aspects of the disease state. So why not hemodynamic sensors? And this is where wireless MEMS sensors came into play. And this is where I'll really start my talk about cardio MEMS, where we are, and where we want to go in the future. So you'll see this slide come up a few times in the talk. Uh, it's going to give a, a chronology of, of cardio MEMS. But we were founded in 2001. And as my introduction alluded to, I've been at Georgia Tech all my life, uh, and I'm still at Georgia Tech. Uh, if, if we show you, I'll show you a map soon. But um, we were founded in 2001 by two individuals. Uh, one was uh, Jay Yadav, and he was a cardiologist. And he was interested in solving a lot of these cardiovascular diseases by finding new technology. He was an entrepreneur at heart, and he really caught on to this idea of MEMS. And he was seeking a MEMS partner to help him solve this problem. And one of the unique things we had here at Georgia Tech that Dr. Allen's work, team was working on was, at the time, we call them non-standard MEMS, so mostly polymers, inductors, ceramics, just a variety of things, uh, including pressure sensors. And this became very attractive to Jay. And they met a few times in 2000. And by 2001, the company was founded. And that's where I came in. I was a, a young kid working for, for Mark Allen at the time. Uh, in fact, in 2000, I was just a research assistant. I wasn't even in grad school yet. And uh, I had told Mark I was interested in, in joining his, his program, and I was interested in startups. I was interested in all these things. And it really was a very fortunate opportunity for me that the company was starting at the time I was going to begin my graduate career. So when I say I've been at tech all my life, it's because it's true. And these little circles reflect you know, the different homes that CardioMIMS has had over the years. We started out over on 10th Street. Let me see if I can find the laser. Is that, that's this guy. Uh, for in, a, in an incubator called ATDC. They're still around. Uh, I believe ATDC is still on 5th Street, if I'm not mistaken. So we moved with them from 10th Street down to 5th Street uh, over at Tech Square. 
and we stayed there a couple of years. And then when we graduated from the incubator space, uh, we built our own space over here in TEP, which is right down the street, shadows of Coca-Cola on the other side of the train tracks, as we like to say. Um, and it's, it, it, was, it was strategically done that way. You know, part of the reason CardiMEMS has always been so close to Georgia Tech is because of the wonderful resources that this institution has and the research that was already ongoing here. Not just for pressure sensors, but the vast availability of tools and technology that comes with the place. And so I've got a, a short slide here. I stole these images from the IEN website. But this was key to our success. And, and uh, as Dr. Brand knows and as David knows, we've, we've always been a partner with, with Georgia Tech because we know the value that the institution provides to us in terms of access to tools that we would never dream of buying or be, able, or be capable of, of acquiring without having access to them. So this, is, this has been a key aspect of the success of our company. Back in the early 2000s, we were looking for sensors that could measure pressure at very high temperatures. These were turbine engine sensors. It was a DARPA research program. I was a second graduate student joining the program to continue on the research that a previous student was working on in terms of this technology. And our goal was, how hot can we measure pressure at? And we got to about 1,000 degrees C. And then that's when CardiMEMS came in, and we diverted all our efforts to migrating the technology from turbine engines to working inside the body. And this took some time. But it's not an original concept. So this is where I want to give you guys perspective as to how long things take and how hard it is to come up with truly novel ideas today. But if you, if you keep working at it from a different point of view or a different angle, you will achieve a, a novel idea of what needs to be done. But this is a paper from Collins dating back to 1967 where he didn't call them sensors back then, he called them tonometers because these devices essentially have a frequency tone that varies with pressure. And that, that concept of that device has been around for a very long time. I think that what we were able to do is take the fabrication technology that we learned here at Georgia Tech and apply it to this type of technology. So when Cardi Mills was founded, we had one goal, and that was let's prove that we can actually use this commercially. We didn't start with heart failure. We actually started with a different application. That application was abdominal aortic aneurysms. This is a, a disease state. It's another chronic disease state. The symptoms are, are not something that you would know or feel. So if, if you happen to have an aneurysm, you wouldn't know it. You can't feel it. And these are aneurysms in your abdomen. Uh, this is a disease state that usually happens in elderly. And until maybe the mid-1990s, there wasn't a lot of knowledge around this disease state. So there wasn't a lot of screening being done. And the result is fairly catastrophic. If you're, if your aorta bursts, then you can bleed to death fairly, fairly quickly. And so the industry came up with a solution. They said, well, why don't we just replumb the inside of your aorta? And that was a reasonable solution. Uh, it's less invasive. The, the, the alternative to this approach is to do surgery. So you could do major surgery. This is, it, it has great success. Unfortunately, it's, it's very catastrophic during the surgery itself, and recovery is very difficult. So a less invasive approach was the stent grafting. One problem with the stent crafts is that they can leak, or there's other vessels, as you see in this cartoon, that can feed blood into the aneurysm that prevent you from excluding the systemic blood flow into this aneurysm. And high pressure in this aneurysm is what leads to the rupture. So we were clever, and we thought, why not just stick a sensor in there and measure the pressure to monitor the health of this aneurysm and ensure that they can keep the pressures low? And this is what we set out to do in the early 2000s. So I, I brought up a slide from 2008 because this is where we were. And the goal of that presentation was to give some insight as to what does it take to go from research in an institution like Georgia Tech to a true commercial product. And this is still true today. It, it took us about five years is when we first commercialized the product. Um, and then the second generation came out two years later. We spent the first four years really developing and understanding the, the technology, how to use it, how to apply it, characterizing it. Um, a lot of the things that we don't tend to do in academia, when I, when I did my thesis, you know, success was measured by can I make the prototype and can I demonstrate with some data that it does what I think it's going to do. When you try to do a commercial product, now you have to get to reliability and reproducibility of those results. And there's a, amount of, a tremendous amount of energy that's needed to get to that. And so this is a, a, a very generic cycle of what it took us to get to 
that product for the abdo abdominal aortic aneurysm sensor. And we started out with initial development, so we had to look at all the biocompatibility aspects, animal implants, and, and if you're in the biomed engineering department, these will all be familiar things that you're probably learning at school today. Um, a lot of bench testing, so reliability was, was king, making sure that when we implant this device into a patient, we knew exactly how it was going to perform and how it was going to operate. This was just demonstration of technology. This is, this is just getting feasibility. So we had, we had published literature at the beginning of this era in terms of understanding what, we, what could be done. We hadn't demonstrated what could be done commercially, and that's what this whole era was about. Then we went into product development, and this is uh, an interesting term for where you really start to convert from feasibility, proof of concept, to commercialized product manufacturing. And so a lot of the manufacturing procedures were developed here. And in the med space, that comes with a lot of documentation. Uh, half my life is documentation. We have to document uh, everything we do. Uh, and if, if you don't document it, then it doesn't really exist. That's FDA's point of view, essentially. There's several industries like that, aerospace, military, and defense. Uh, have very similar standards in terms of documentation. Everything's got to be documented. So we spent a good bit of time establishing that documentation, that package that we give to the FDA so that they can actually approve the product. And then we launched the product. We learned a lot of things here. One was, what does it take to make these MEM sensors, commercialize them, and then implant them into patients? There's a lot of learning that happened during that time frame. We also got credibility with the FDA. You know, we were newcomers, they didn't know who we were. This was new technology in the space. Wireless measurement of intrabody metrics had never been done before, not like this, not in a permanent implant. So we needed to demonstrate to the FDA and to ourselves that we could do it, and that's what this exercise was about. This was all before heart failure. So now we're here, seven years later. So from concept and idea to demonstrating proof of technology and concept in a commercially viable application. One key about this application was FDA approval. There's different ways to get FDA approval. One is through a pre-market approval process, which is very lengthy. Uh, usually you're trying to prove efficacy and safety, and it's a fairly large clinical trial and it takes many years. Another one is called the 510K, and this is where you, you essentially claim that there's other predicate devices like yours. In our case, for this application, it was a catheter tube measuring pressure inside the aneurysm. Just before you seal the aneurysm, they would pull that catheter tube out. But it was an acute use. So acute means just temporary during the procedure, not long-term use. And we managed to get that kind of labeling and get approval, and that was fairly quick for, for a product like ours. We knew that for heart failure, it was going to be a full clinical study. We had to show efficacy and evidence of the product. So I bring back this slide again. Now we were ready to pursue this application. And one interesting thing that came about is we weren't the first ones to pursue this application. Actually, Medtronic had a device called the Chronicle. And from the late 1990s into the early 2000s, they were pursuing a pressure sensor that was similar to a pacemaker. It would have what they call in industry a can with a lead that fit into the ventricle, and it would measure pressure in the ventricle. And that was really the first trial of trying to measure pressure inside the heart uh, with a device. And so we learned a lot from their clinical study, and we specifically targeted this class of patients for a reason. The reason was the rate of hospitalization was high. So when you're trying to prove some scientific evidence in medicine, you want to have a lot of opportunity to prove that in the sense that it'll minimize your clinical study. If you don't want to have a study that's several thousand patients large, you need to find a patient population and where the occurrence of event of things that you're trying to look for happens fairly high. And so this patient population was key in the sense that they weren't so sick that they're needing advanced therapies, but they're not so healthy that the rate of occurrence of what you're looking for is too low. And what we were looking for was hospitalizations. So what happens to these patients is when they're hospitalized, and this is, if you think of this as heart function versus time, every time they're hospitalized, it's causing damage to the heart. And so prevention of that hospitalization was a key aspect of our technology and what we were seeking to demonstrate scientifically in our clinical study. So it wasn't as simple as, can we measure pressure? It was demonstrate that there's value in measuring this pressure. And that was a bar set by the FDA. And it's not common. I think it's uh, typically for a diagnostic device. Usually you're just 
demanded to prove that you can make the measurements accurately and precisely, not demonstrate actual value. But the FDA's point of view was, this is going to revolutionize how we perform therapy in these patients. And so you have to show that there's some benefit, positive benefit, in the therapy that's provided, not just that you measure pressure. And so our bar went from, you know, a diagnostic tool to now almost a therapy. If you think about what's happening to these patients, you know, the, the thesis behind why we were interested in measuring pressure is, we call this our wedge, but if you look at the right side, this is essentially the event. So this is when the patient has been hospitalized. You're being rushed to the emergency room. This is time zero, and this is what you're trying to prevent. And standard of care was looking at weights and symptoms. This is where we still live today. A lot of clinics today that manage heart failure ask about your weight and ask about your symptoms. And you're very, very close within a week or less than a week of potentially being hospitalized if you're waiting this long before you take action. Action is change of medication, change in lifestyle, change in diet, uh, these types of things that can prevent you from getting, getting hospitalized. In literature, we already knew that filling pressures within the heart, again, this is a pump. The hemodynamics matter. So what was interesting to us and what's interesting to me is why is it taking so long for the industry to recognize what the key variables are in managing symptoms or chronic diseases of the heart, and why haven't we done anything about it? But we knew that hemodynamic aspects of the heart were key and actually leading indicators to the disease that we were trying to manage and prevent. And so Medtronic knew this, and they, they actually published some information relating to this. This, this is actually uh, Dr. Adamson, who's our medical director today, but at the time he was a practicing cardiologist managing a lot of heart failure patients. And he had a, a lot of knowledge of you know, what these patients lived through uh, and how to best manage them. And they were looking for a tool. They thought Medtronic's tool would be it. Unfortunately, their device did not meet their primary endpoints. So then they joined up with CardioMEMS and they were part of our PIs in our clinical study. And we set out to demonstrate that if you manage the patients with pressure, so this is now the variable that you're using to adjust your medication, adjust how you manage the disease, that you can prevent, prevent this from happening. Our product is, uh, is developed over the last 10 years and it really is, is formulated from three different aspects or really four. I'll, I'll lump one into the top here. The, the sensor and delivery system is, is the way we get the sensor into the body. There, there's an external readout electronics that we use to measure patient's pressure every day. But ultimately, what the physician really cares about, this is really neat and they get all excited about this, but really, the information is what they're looking for. This is information they've never had. This is the feedback that they need. So, Many of you guys went through uh, engineering in undergrad and you probably went into systems and controls and you probably could not imagine trying to develop any kind of system without feedback or control. And that's really essentially what we're trying to provide the physician. It's feedback, a feedback loop of information to manage these patients. The sensor is a, a MEM sensor and this is a, a cartoon of how it operates. And it's a very simple concept. And the simplicity dates back to when we were trying to measure pressure in high temperature. You know, when we were thinking about how do I measure at 500C, 1000C, most of the things we had at the time, tools would probably melt uh, or not function appropriately. And so it really limited us, limited us to a design space that was purely a materials problem. How can I make these materials in a shape that give me a signal, electrical signal that I can read out? And ultimately what that led to was a inductive capacitive resonant circuit that varied with pressure. And so here's a cartoon of what that looks like. If you have a, you could do this with the varying inductance or varying capacitance. I think for us, capacitance was easier to vary than inductance, but it, it really doesn't matter. The tone of this device or the frequency varies with pressure and we can measure that using an inductively coupled system. This was really hard to do. <laughs> uh, some of the simplest things are sometimes the hardest things to do, but that's, I think, part of the, the neat aspect of the technology and its reliability is the fact that it's so simple. So, you know, we looked at a lot of literature back in the day, and, it's, and, and when I was doing my graduate work in MEMS, it's always very easy to complicate things, but sometimes it's best to take the harder road and simplify it. Keep, keep thinking, what is the simplest thing I can create that will solve the problem? Because ultimately, more complex tends to mean more, more problems or more reliability issues. That's not always true, 
but that's, that's a guiding principle we had and a philosophy we had. So we had no batteries. Um, we didn't want to limit the longevity of the implant. Batteries today are advancing significantly, and I'm certain in the future we're going to have batteries in these devices, but initially we didn't want to go that route because of reliability. As well as the active circuit aspect of it, uh, we wanted to keep it as simple as possible and as reliable as possible, so that was a guiding philosophy. And then that pushed a lot of the complexity into the external electronics. One of the unknown aspects of CardiMEMS is that the electronics is, is just as neat from an engineering and technology point of view as the sensor is uh, in terms of its ability to measure inductively coupled devices from many inches away. If you, if you look at most RFID tag books, you know, they're measuring within an inch a few centimeters away from those, those devices. Uh, in our case, we're measuring within the body, which is, which is a challenge. If you think about our body being fluid, being a conductive body, it's difficult for RF to penetrate the body. You have to go into a very low frequency. And to achieve those low frequencies, you have to scale the device. So when you're, when you're dealing purely with geometries and materials, size and frequency are, are counter to each other. So we set out to demonstrate efficacy for this device. We, we had shown we could measure pressure in the industry, and that was through our abdominal aortic aneurysm sensor. Uh, next, we had to go sh show what could we do with this product. And it turns out that since there was no product like ours before, this is when you demonstrate the greatest amount of gains in these types of disease management. So we were able to show a 33% reduction in hospitalization for this patient population. And that might not seem like a lot in other areas, but in the med device where usually you're trying to gain 5%, 10%, where these, these uh, percentages are large, 33 was unprecedented for this industry. They had, they had no other device or technology or even therapy that was achieving this level of reduction uh, for the entire cross-section. So when I showed you that graph of heart failure and we had preserved ejection fraction versus reduced ejection fraction, these are different phases of heart failure, different types of heart failure. We showed this across the board for all devices. And, and it wasn't a surprise to us because at the end of the day, as I mentioned, heart failure is about volume and pressure. And so giving insight into what's going on inside the body was key for these physicians to be able to improve, improve these patients' lives. So that gets us to just last year where we got approval in 2014. Uh, this was a, a great day for, for us. Uh, and that led to our acquisition. St. Jude commercialized the product and then we were acquired by Abbott uh, last year. And uh, now the goal is to, to see where we can take the technology. So I'll, I'll, I'll show you this graph. This is a, a very simple graph of uh, clinical evidence. If you work in the med space, you know, this is the challenge that we're faced with today after you've demonstrated that it just works. So all along for the last 17 years, we've been trying to show, hey, the product works, we can measure pressure, it's actually reliable, and you can do something beneficial about it. And if you go to the American Heart Association or any other association that's dealing with any chronic disease, they usually have a guideline, and then they'll also have a guideline as to how they weigh the different types of scientific evidence for those disease states. And they break it down into the level of evidence, which the best starts at the top and works its way down. So you've got many trials, many populations, usually many companies, many competitors, lots of information, rich pool of information associated with disease management. A single study with limited populations is next. And then typically below that is expert opinions or case studies at an individual clinic. So this is, this is the level of evidence that's needed. And then they've got a classification for the risk to benefit. And so obviously we want to be up here uh, and not down here. And where we are today is we're a single data point right there, essentially. We've done one study with very high risk to benefit demonstration. And so the goal, the challenge for us, our perspective today is not so much can we do it, but what can we do with it and change the mindsets of individuals and become common knowledge or standard of care. So with that, I open the floor to any questions. I'd, I can talk about this uh, stuff all day long. Uh, I've been doing it for a long time. And if we want to go into the more technical aspects of the product, uh, into more biomedical aspects of the product, I'd be, I'd be happy to do so. Thank you.
Yes. Uh, first and foremost, I just want to preface, uh, you know, I really thank you for coming here and also that the work that you're doing is literally, you know, work that actually changes lives. And, and for that reason, I have to ask a series of extra questions. Sure. Of, uh, when I look at the men's literature, there were so many other areas you being a graduate student that you could have gone. Like you could have gone to, I think it started like a good application for the airbag or something like that. You could have went into cell phones or another derivative of you know, maybe engines. I know GE has yep. a lot of work in there. Yep. Why did you decide to choose something so risky up front? Which is you knew clearly yeah. up front yeah. that there's going to be a long yeah. horizon. And what exactly did you tell venture capitalists who knew that this is a the, the whole premise of it is high return, high high risk? risk. And, uh, yeah. Like, how did you guys even well, after Medtronic you found out about Medtronic? Like, right? how did you? Yeah, I mean it's uh, it's not easy, and there's not a simple answer. And and for me, at least, my for my career is partly luck. So it's what I was doing and what we were working in. And I wasn't going to forego an opportunity to go work for a startup when I was starting my graduate work. At the time, we had no idea whether it was going to succeed or fail, like every other startup. Uh, certainly, the field of of medical devices uh, had an easier time in, in capital funding in the early 2000s. I think today it's a much riskier proposition and. I think it'd be a lot harder today, potentially, for us to have survived. Um, in terms of the space, you know, there, sensors, if I look back, and, and I'm happy that we ended up where we did, because I think <clears throat> the type of work that we do is, is very inspiring, you know, actually helping patients. We get to visit with a lot of patients, we get to hear their stories, and that's very impactful, much more so than any of the other industries. So certainly, our phones, our cars, all this technology is, is filled with MEMS devices. In fact, there's been an explosion of MEMS use and um, it's, it's far more exciting today than it was back when I was starting, which most people didn't even know what the word MEMS standed for. Um, at least I didn't and I'd never heard it before. So it was a little bit of struck of luck. It was honestly the vision that our founders had, you know, and I, uh, I started with them on that ride and I've stayed with it all along. But I don't know that we could have predicted any of the factors that you describe in terms of we didn't know prospectively um, what challenges we were gonna meet. We just knew that the work was valuable and that it had meaning. And so, you know, that's part of the story is if you believe in something and you find something to, to be valuable, you, you need to stick with it. it. It takes a long time in the med space and you need to come in that with your eyes wide open in terms of the potential longevity that you're signing up for. Uh, because nothing happens quick. We're not going to be like an Instagram. We're not going to be like these apps today that turn over into a billion dollar industry in a matter of a couple of years. Um, but at the end of the day, it works very rewarding. And that's probably the most satisfying part about it. Yes. Yeah, so the way the device works is the sensor is a purely passive resonant circuit. And when you're not energizing it with RF, it's, it's purely dormant. So the electronics has the job of energizing it with an RF field, and our frequency is, is a band of 30 to 37 megahertz. Uh, that was a sweet spot for us in terms of how low can I get the frequency, because I want to penetrate deep into the body, yet how small can I make the device? If you want lower frequency, you tend to have to make it larger or find greater energy density. So you start thinking about high dielectric materials, you start thinking about um, high permeable materials in terms of uh, ferrites or, or magnets and things of that nature. But then you also have to worry about stability and longevity. And so for us, you know, we felt like let's not deal with materials that potentially could be unstable over time. Let's go with an air core coil. Let's do an air gap capacitor. And that limit us, limited us in terms of what size and dimension. Great, so that sets that. Now you have to go make an electronics. The way the electronics works is, it has two antennas, really. One is to transmit and one is to, to listen or receive. And it works a lot like sonar. So if you think of sonar, you, you ping, it sends a wave out, and then the reflectance back is what you listen for. And so our electronics does that very, very fast. The, the ring down time, if you think about the ring down of a resonator, is within a few microseconds. So 100,000 times a second, we're, singing, we're pinging and listening to the sensor. And it's through near-field inductive coupling. So that's. Um, that's how the device works. 
the electronics has a phase lock loop that once it locks onto that frequency, it'll phase lock loop onto it and now it can track it as it's moving uh, across the pressure gradient. So I guess the measure from the base and the and Yeah, and at the time the idea was, well, we can always upgrade the externals, but the implant's permanent. Um, I like to use a stent as, a, as an analogy. You know, stents get put in, they never get removed. So our sensor gets implanted and it's never gonna come out. Um, out of the pulmonary vasculature. Uh, I have two questions. So the first one is, why did you choose uh, making this pulmonary orchestration? Why did you choose that uh, orchestration or other like pressure split in the heart? Like, I think that's one question. Yeah. And the second is, I guess the thickness of measurement depends on the patient. So patients, I guess, you use the external glass. So uh, and so when the patients. Uh, measures the pH, uh, is it kind of an average over a one second interval or average over a like 10 second yeah. interval? Like what's the more, like is that maybe more the pulmonary, pulmonary orchestration? Yeah, great question. So the first question goes back to in, you know, in the original design concept, we thought about what are all the key aspects of the cardiac cycle that, that you would be interested in. And if, you, if you're familiar with the heart, there's a left side of the heart, which is pumping blood to your body. And the left ventricle is the, main, is the main aspect of the heart that pumps all the blood to the body. Um, and one of the first areas the blood goes to is it goes out of your heart to your arms, your head, and, and your feet. And so one of the risks of putting any devices in the left ventricle lead to stroke. And so when we're doing kind of this risk-benefit analysis of where to measure and what to measure and what could be the potential risks or the safety aspect of our product, that conversation came into play a lot in terms of where do we go. So we said, well, the left side is kind of risky at the end of the day because our device is, uh, is not, it's not like a lead, like a pacemaker lead, where if the anchoring mechanism fails or something happens, it's not going anywhere. It's going to stay tethered, uh, whereas our device is not tethered. So we excluded the left ventricle. Then we thought about the right ventricle. What about, what about the device here? And, that seemed to make more sense to us. The right side is a, a lot safer, it's a lot lower pressure. It can lead to the same value of information. Maybe, you know, the, the, most doctors care about left ventricular pressure, but that's a lot riskier area to be in. So we said, well, let's give them right ventricular pressure and see if we can demonstrate the same information there. And when we went through our risk-benefit analysis, um, one of the failure modes was, well, if it dislodges, it's gonna end up in your lung, like an embolism. And so we said, why don't we just have a controlled delivery into the lung, and then we won't have to worry about it failing into the lung. And I say that tongue in cheek, but that's kind of the thought process that evolved into, let's see if we can pursue a sensor there. It's also out of the way in the pulmonary artery. Uh, you get a lot of similar information that you're looking for from the pulmonary artery, same value of information that you would get from the right side of the ventricle or the right atrium um, without being in the way of other devices. So precluding them from getting, say, leads or other implanted devices as well as a lot safer from a profile of a device. And when you're a diagnostic, you know, FDA is more tolerant to risk when you're providing therapy, but if you're truly a diagnostic device, their tolerance to risk is much lower, and so we have to consider that. So that's, that's the first one. The second question was? Uh, it was about uh, the measurement. The oh yeah, so the measurement, that's a, it's an interesting thing. When we went to doctors and we, were, and we were telling them about getting readings every day, the first thing they said is, I, I don't want so much, they have nothing now, they don't want to be flooded with information later. So we had to find the right amount of data that would suit them. Today we measure about 18 seconds, so we get a couple of breaths. So you can see their respiratory cycle as well as their heart rate uh, in the reading that we collect. It, it takes uh, 18 seconds plus another minute or two to get the information and transmit it to the database. And we asked them to do that once a day, and that's, that's more than sufficient for what we needed to prove in our clinical study. Uh, certainly, you could think about getting more data, getting less data, but at the end of the day, what our label showed was that one reading a day of about a few minutes is more than enough to get the benefit that we demonstrated. So there's, there's kind of this uh, balancing of how much is enough and what benefit can you get out of it. Let me go back here. Kind 
Yeah, that's a good business question. And, and certainly uh, there's no magic eight ball for that. You know, I think what I learned from watching my managers as I was coming up through the ranks in Cardium M's and the strategy they deployed is that at the end of the day, what they look for is they look for individuals with character, you know. And uh, most of the time, if they've had a solid education, uh, which you would get at Georgia Tech or any other high institution, uh, then you're looking for what's their character like? Can they learn? Do they have appetite for learning? Um, because you can't usually train, train that in individuals. So, you know, for certainly we made many mistakes, and, um, but we also were very fortunate to have a lot of great individuals working at our company. And certainly this was a team effort. I, I get to go around and present about Cardimums, but certainly this was not necessarily my baby or my own thing. It was a huge team effort that led to our success all along the way, initially with developing the technology, later with performing a clinical study. It's, it's very difficult for startups to do a full pre-market approval study. Uh, and then now in the commercialization aspect of it, leveraging all these big companies' uh, budgets as well as sales force to go and promote and deliver the product. So I'd, I'd say today when I hire, when I look at individuals that we want to keep for longevity, you know, how do I assess their character? And, and, and that's really the biggest measure of whether they're going to turn out to be a really good employee or not. Let me go here and then I'll come to you. So with Advent of Cloud Computing, you see senior centers kind of being paired up with other cloud-level guys, kind of like diet and exercise, meditation, and so on. Yeah, and certainly all the wearables today are becoming you know, a big key aspect. They're now making their way into med. Um, certainly if you look at Apple and their watch, they're looking at a lot of uh, medical applications by measuring telemetry from their watch. And they're not the only ones, but they're certainly one of the biggest ones. I'd say that Abbott's going to be very interested in trying to integrate our sensing knowledge of making implants with a lot of their other technologies that they have in terms of, you know, one of the things that Abbott got when they bought St. Jude is they have a huge portfolio now of cardiovascular disease. So Abbott had a lot of stents and uh, wires and catheters, and St. Jude had a lot of the cardiac rhythm and management products, which are the ICDs, the CRTs, uh, as well as the pumps, and they also had CardiMem. So now Abbott's well positioned to, to really lead, lead that space in heart failure. They have a product for just about every aspect of heart failure disease. So now for us, it's about growing CardiMems, getting to that standard of care, getting for the agencies that, that define how you care for a patient to list pulmonary artery pressure sensing devices. And, and that takes time. You have to build up the evidence, but also integrating some of that across, across the boundaries. Beyond that, you know, you can imagine all the different spaces in the body where pressure is going to be key. It's not just in the cardiovascular system. And so then it's going to be about the appetite for Abbott and or other competition to, to pursue those areas. Certainly we're not, we're not alone. Uh, competition's coming. Um, and so that'll, to me that's exciting because that's a sign that we're, we're doing the right thing. Let me, yep. Um, you know what I like, the <clears throat> simplicity of the device. But in the side sentence, you were saying you believe in the future that we'll have batteries. Yep. <laughs> Can you say a little bit more about it? Why yeah. you want to make it more complicated? So there's always going to be a desire to do more things. And with more things, you have to have more levers to be able to do such things. So one of the limitations of this technology is, as a standalone sensor for just measuring pressure where we measure, it does a great job. The moment you start thinking about how do I have it integrate with other devices or other things, now it's very challenging because if it's trying to communicate with another implant, now it's on the onus of that other implant to carry all the electronics and the RF power to talk to our device, which is not miniaturizable per se at this time, uh, as well as other, other metrics that, that are interesting to monitor. So even looking at other variables? So, so now for us, now that we understand, at least internally, in my development team, we understand very well what does it take to measure pressure inside the body or what, is it, what does it take to measure anything really inside the body. How do we expand that to other, other things and how do we do more with it in terms of integrating to other devices or collecting different data sets. And for that we're going to need, we're gonna need more variables to, 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 to the design space that are beyond just geometry, chemistry and materials. which does a great job for what we're doing, but in the long run, it's going to be a limiting factor for us moving forward. And 
our sense is that if we don't do it, somebody else is going to. So we're, we're looking at a variety of different aspects for not just energy density in a passive way, so how do we, how do we capture more RF energy to then do more things with, um, but then there's always this hanging aspect of, well, you can also store energy in the device through a battery, and why not consider that as well? So I think, I think that's coming, unfortunately, and so we either need to be in front of it or we're gonna be behind, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, They're very expensive. Yeah, so <laughs> during your clinical trial, how much was the reduction rate due to like cost or um, comfortability for, for, for the patient? Uh, like were there many people who received bronchopathy surgery or will it be compensated like to something in the future? Yeah, so that's a that's a that's a problem that all uh, PMA or even any clinical study is going to face in terms of how do they ensure enrollment because you know you you write a protocol which is you tell the FDA here's what I want to do here's how I want to do it here's how many people I need to do it with statistically to show and prove with power um, the effects that I'm trying to show and so then they sign off and say yeah and they say okay now now go do it and certainly consent is a, is a big aspect of, of clinical trials uh, and for that we had to hire a whole clinical department that was experienced in doing that achieving consent. You're not always going to get consent from all patients. Most of the time in technology like ours where it's never been done before, you're going to be paying for the procedures and you're going to be paying for the trial. Uh, and so for us that was a huge uh, cost aspect of, of the business and we had to raise capital to pursue that. And there's different ways of pursuing capital and, and um, certainly there's a lot of external forces that drive the way capital swings. So I don't know if that's answering your question, but you know, the, the cost of the patient wasn't necessarily the first thing on their mind because they're not paying for it out of pocket. For them, it's more, this is a study that's never been proven before. Am I willing to take the risk in being part of this study or not? It's an unfortunate thing that a lot of these patients are very, very sick. And so they're, they're really sick and tired of feeling that way. And a lot of them are very open-minded in terms of trying, trying different things. Um, and so for us, that was a benefit in, in terms of enrollment. But, it still took us about three years to enroll all the patients that we wanted to. It was about 550 patients, and, um, and it's a slow process at the end of the day. All right, I think in light of the time, we'll say thank you to Michael. Thank you. <laughs> we'll see you.